Megan and Ken are deciding how they will spend the evening. You have some time to look at questions one to seven now. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Now listen carefully and answer questions one to seven. Hello, Megan speaking. Hello, Megan. Hello, Ken. I'm glad you called. Thomas asked me to give you his telephone number. Is that his office number or his home number? I can give you both. His new home number is nine four five two three four five six. Would you like his office number? I think I have it. Does nine seven three one four three two two sound right? That's it. But the home number. Is nine four five two three four five six. He moved in last week. Good, I've got that. Now, what would you like to do? Well, I'd like to go dancing, but Jane's hurt her ankle, so she'd rather not. That's a pity. I guess it means she doesn't want to play tennis either. That's right. She says it's okay to go bowling if we don't expect her to do well. Okay, let's do it. I guess we can go dancing some other time. Well, I booked us some time at the bowling alley of Entertainment City. Do you know it? Is it on Smith Street, down near the university? That's right. It's on the corner of Smith Street and Bridge Road. What time did you book for? The first booking I could get was eight o'clock. Okay, it's seven now. What do you want to do first? Well, I think we should leave now. We can meet at the bowling alley. I can't be that quick. I have to call Thomas to start with, and I need to get changed. Okay, I think I'll leave in ten minutes and meet you in there. That makes sense. I'll take my car, so I'll be quite quick. I'll be out of here in half an hour. Okay. You're so lucky to have a car. You can get around so easily. Well, yes, and no. I often spend ages driving around trying to find a park. The traffic can be very bad. Well, that won't be a problem for me because I'll take the bus. It goes right past my door, and I'll have plenty of time. Sounds good. Who else is coming? I think nearly everyone from the afternoon class will be there. Which class? The big maths class or the afternoon tutorial? The maths class. What's more, we get a concession for large numbers. That's good. I'm trying to keep my expenses down this month. So am I. I expect tonight will cost about twenty dollars. You must be good with money. I expect it to come to hmm, nearly forty dollars. So how are you going to manage that? Well, the bus is cheap, and if I come home early, I won't have time to spend too much. In any case, I have to be up early tomorrow morning, so I'd really better try to get home by about eleven. That reminds me, I have to phone the taxi company for my mother. Goodbye, Megan. I'll see you later. Goodbye, Ken. Ken calls the taxi company. First, look at questions eight and.
Thank you for calling Acme Cabs. Please follow the instructions on the tape. If you wish to order a cab now, press 1. If you have placed an order previously, press 2. If you wish to make an advance order, press 3. Please be ready to tell us your street number and name. If you wish to speak to the radio room supervisor, press 4. If you want to inquire about lost property, press 5. If you want to order a taxi equipped to carry wheelchairs, press 6. Your call is very important. Please stay on the line for the next available order taker. Hello. I think I left something in one of your cabs on Thursday. It was a brown paper package with an address written on it in green ink. Has anyone handed it in? That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. You will hear some information about a medical museum in London called the Hunterian Museum, which is part of the Royal College of Surgeons. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 15. Now listen and answer questions 11 to 15. Good evening. I'm here to tell you about the Hunterian Museum in London, which is part of the Royal College of Surgeons. Although a medical museum, it is open to the general public. The museum specialises in the history of the study of anatomy, and especially the work of John Hunter, in the 18th century. If you would like a free guided tour of the museum, then come along at one o'clock any Wednesday. Spaces on the tour are limited to 25, though, so it's best to reserve a place by phone, and these tours are for individual members of the public, families, and small groups of friends only. Tours for groups of school students can also be arranged, and these are also free of charge. Teachers are encouraged to make a donation of around £3 per student if they can afford it, but this isn't obligatory. What teachers must do, however, is phone to agree a time in advance, as only one school party is allowed in at a time. Then there's an online booking form which you can use to confirm the booking. Or just send a letter if you prefer. For older students and adult groups, we provide more specialised tours, and these cost £100 for a short tour of 30 minutes, or if you want a slightly longer one, it's £130 for 45 minutes. There is a student discount, however, so college groups would pay £75 for the shorter tour, for example. In terms of facilities available at the museum, teachers and others should bear in mind that space is very limited. As we're in the centre of London, with many cafes and restaurants nearby, refreshments aren't sold on site though there is a small shop selling souvenirs. Most of the things on show in the museum are preserved animal specimens in glass cases, so there are no interactive displays aimed at small children. 
and our tours are only in English, although there is printed material available in other major languages on request. There's also a lecture room, which groups can book for an extra charge, and this is equipped with PowerPoint projector and microscopes. Before you hear the rest of the presentation, you have some time to look at questions 16 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 16 to 20. Next, a bit about the history of the museum and the preserved animal and plant specimens you can see there. The museum's named after John Hunter, who was a pioneer in the study of anatomy. He was among the first to understand that the study of other animals could tell us a lot about how the human body works. John Hunter was born in 1728 and came to London to work as an assistant in an anatomy school in 1748. Here John did his training in the study of human anatomy. It was after 1760, however, that he turned his attention to animals. That's when he became a surgeon in the army, spending three years in France and Portugal, where he started collecting and preserving animal specimens, such as lizards. On his return to London in 1763, Hunter set up in private practice and started to build up his collection of specimens. When he moved to a big house in Leicester Square in 1783, Hunter started to take in resident students and gave the name Teaching Museum to his collection. By the time of his death in 1793, Hunter had collected specimens from all over the world, including the first kangaroo to be seen outside Australia. He had 14,000 different exhibits, with 500 species of plants and animals represented. And many of these specimens can still be seen in the museum today, because in 1799 the collection was purchased by the government, who presented it to the Royal College of Surgeons. And they've been looking after it ever since, which is why the Hunterian Museum is located in their building in London to this day. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. You will hear a radio program in which the speakers discuss the importance of looking after old people in winter. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 24. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 24. Now listen and answer the questions.
Nobody likes cold weather, but for old people it can be particularly uncomfortable and dangerous. They can become cold without even noticing it. To keep warm, they may need help from friends and neighbors like you. To find out how we can help, we've invited a representative from the Social Service Department at the Town Hall to talk about the Winter Warmth Code campaign. Mr. Hastings, can I first ask you why it is so important to keep an eye on elderly people during cold weather such as we've been having lately? Yes. There are two main reasons. First, the old suffer from the cold more than the rest of us. They're not as active or strong as you and me, and it's harder for them to keep warm. This can lead to all sorts of complications. They have less resistance to infection. The quality of their lives is badly affected, and in extreme cases, they may need to be hospitalized. According to the newspapers, old people are actually dying of the cold. Is this true? I'm afraid it is. I said before there were two main reasons why we should keep an eye on old people. Well, the other major problem is that so many pensioners cannot afford to heat their homes properly. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 25 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 25 to 30. They may already be living in difficult circumstances. Then, in an exceptionally cold winter such as this one, they may just not have enough money to pay for the extra heating necessary. It seems terrible that in a society such as ours this should be happening. It is. And what the Winter Warmth Code campaign aims to do is to bring this problem to the attention not only of the government, but of everybody else in society. We all have a duty towards our old people to make sure that they do not suffer in this cold weather. So now to the practical side of things. What can we do to help? Well, we all know someone old, a relative maybe, a neighbor, someone living round the corner. We should adopt that person and make sure that we spare a few minutes every day to check that everything is okay. Make sure, even if the old person is not actually ill, that he or she is not suffering. Check when you go inside that the house or flat doesn't feel cold to you. It's a good idea to try to feel some part of their body, like their face or hands. Old people can become cold without even noticing it, you know. Okay. And if a person is too poor to afford to heat the house or flat? The best thing, then, is for the old person to live in one room only and to make sure that that one room is warm. Check that the bed is on an inside wall. Move it yourself if necessary. Check the room for drafts. A lot of cold air gets into the room through old windows or badly fitting doors. Is food important? Yes. Make sure that the old person is eating well. You could help by cooking for them or doing the shopping. Remember, a good hot meal a day makes a big difference. Also, make sure that they are well dressed. Old people need to wear more layers of clothes than we do, particularly at night. One last question, Mr. Hastings. Is there nothing the state can do to help? Oh, yes, indeed. Contact your town hall to find out about local organizations already involved in this kind of work. If there is a local Meals on Wheels service, for instance, you could get your adopted old person on the list. Then, of course, there are also many state benefits which an old person could be entitled to and which he or she doesn't know about, and which therefore he or she is not claiming. An extra problem here is that it can often be complicated, 
and old people don't like going to Social Security offices to fill in forms and all that. You can help by finding out for them what possibilities exist for claiming a little extra money from the government, then applying for it for them. That little extra could make all the difference. Yes, indeed. Well, Mr. Hastings, thank you for coming in and talking to us today. Thank you. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Part 4. You will hear a woman giving a talk at a popular science convention. She is describing research into artificial gills designed to enable humans to breathe underwater. Now you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen and answer questions 31 to 40. In my talk today, I'll be exploring the idea of artificial gills. I'll start by introducing the concept, giving some background and so forth, and then I'll go on to explain the technological applications, including a short, very simple experiment I conducted. Starting with the background. As everyone knows, all living creatures need oxygen to live. Mammals take in oxygen from the atmosphere by using their lungs, and fishes take oxygen from water by means of their gills, which of course, in most fishes, are located either side of their head. But human beings have always dreamt of being able to swim underwater like the fishes, breathing without the help of oxygen tanks. I don't know whether any of you have done any scuba diving, but it's a real pain having to use all that equipment. You need special training, and it's generally agreed that tanks are too heavy and big to enable most people to move and work comfortably underwater. So scientists are trying a different tack. Rather than humans carrying an oxygen supply as they go underwater, wouldn't it be possible to extract oxygen in situ that is, directly from the water, while swimming. In the 1960s, the famous underwater explorer Jacques Cousteau, for example, predicted that one day surgery could be used to equip humans with gills. He believed our lungs could be bypassed and we would learn to live underwater just as naturally as we live on land. But of course, most of us would prefer not to go to such extremes. <laughs> I've been looking at some fairly simple technologies developed to extract oxygen from water, ways to produce a simple, practical artificial gill enabling humans to live and breathe in water without harm. Now, how scientists and inventors went about this was to look at the way different animals handled this. Fairly obviously, they looked at the way fishes breathe, but also how they move down and float up to the surface using inflatable sacs called swim bladders. Scientists also looked at animals without gills, which use bubbles of air underwater, notably beetles. These insects contrive to stay underwater for long periods by breathing from this bubble which they hold under their wing cases. By looking at these animal adaptations, inventors began to come up with their own artificial gills. 
Now, making a crude gill is actually rather easy. More straightforward. You take a watertight box, which is made of a material which is permeable to gas, that is, it allows it to pass through inwards and outwards. You then fill this with air, fix it to the diver's face, and go down under water. But a crucial factor is that the diver has to keep the water moving so that water high in oxygen is always in contact with the gill, so he can't really stay still. And to maximize this contact, it's necessary for your gill to have a big surface area. Different gill designers have addressed this problem in different ways, but many choose to use a network or lattice arrangement of tiny tubes as part of their artificial gills. Then the diver is able to breathe in and out. Oxygen from the water passes through the outer walls of the gill and carbon dioxide is expelled. In a nutshell, that's how the artificial gill works. So, having read about these simple gill mechanisms, I decided to create my own. I followed the procedure I've just described, and it worked pretty well when I tried it out in the swimming pool. I lasted underwater for nearly 40 minutes. However, I've read about other people breathing through their gill for several hours. So, the basic idea works well, but the real limitation is that these simple gills don't work as the diver descends to any great depth because the pressure builds and a whole different set of problems are caused by that. Research is being done into how these problems might be overcome, but that's another story, which has to be a subject of another talk. <laughs> Despite this serious limitation, Many people have high hopes for the artificial gill, and they think it might have applications beyond simply enabling an individual to stay underwater for a length of time. For example, the same technology might be used to provide oxygen for submarines, enabling them to stay submerged for months on end without resorting to potentially dangerous technologies such as nuclear power. Another idea is to use oxygen derived from the water as energy for fuel cells. These could power machinery underwater, such as robotic devices. So, in my view, this is an area of technology with great potential. Now, if anyone has any questions, I'd be happy to answer. I yes, um, lady at the... That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.